Hello and welcome to another special episode of Inside the Tanks. Today we're going to take a closer look at the restoration and maintenance of this, the M24 Chaffee. And once again, we're joined by Gavin from Armoured Engineering. So Gav, the Chaffee, what sort of condition was this vehicle in when you received it then? Uh, yeah, so it was in a lot worse condition than this. Uh, if you imagine uh, you, put, you leave all the floor bungs in and then park it out on a hillside for 20 years and then let the weather roll in and out, fill it up with water. It was full of water to probably about the top of the track level. So everything below that was completely corroded. The engines were sea solid. Uh, all the bulkheads in the rear were completely gone. It was in a sorry state. And when you get a vehicle into the workshops, do you like take a look at it in that state and go, this is going to take us you know, X amount of years or would you never really have a plan that far in advance? No, so with a project like this, you, you, you have it in your mind, can you do it? And there's normally a yes or a no. There's no or maybe, it's a yes or a no. But you never really consider how long that's going to take you. Trying to do an estimate, if you're trying to think like a business and go, well, I estimate that's going to cost whatever or take this long. You can't do it because you don't know what you're going to walk into. It's, Find out why, should we investigate something You learn else? on the way, yes, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So looking more closely at this vehicle then, I mean, again, absolutely pristine. Um, suspension, I mean, torsion bar suspension, easy to restore, easy to maintain, I'd imagine. Oh, they are actually, yeah. There's not really much to go wrong with them, apart from the torsion bars sometimes snap, but you can get those remade. Uh, we was very lucky that all of the running gear on this was in perfect condition. Uh, all the torsion bars, the bearings, wheel bearings, you name it. Really, really good condition. I'm going to have to ask you, Hemlock 3, quite an unusual name. It is, so we've, we've marked this one up as, as a British chaffee. It's, it's called Hemlock 3 because it was mentioned in the book by Bill Bellamy, a uh, tank commander. So he was a British tank commander uh, commanding a Cromwell and he got upgraded to chaffee. I'm not quite sure if that's an upgrade or a downgrade or what, yeah. but he used the term upgrade to chaffee and his chaffee was called Hemlock 3. So we're not saying this is his tank. We're not saying this was a British tank, but it's telling that story, it's, it's to represent but that. But there are another, other things that make you feel this was a British tank, wasn't there? Yes, so the British did order 600 odd chaffees and we believe they had 300 or so delivered. And we found three or four things on this vehicle that suggest this could have been used by the British. The number one being the, in the turret where the 19 set radio mounts. Um, there are actually holes in the back of the turret that are the perfect size and position for the mounting feet for that radio. If it was only used by the Americans, they wouldn't have drilled those holes where they are. They would have, they would have been somewhere else. Um, there's a track bracket on the rear there for holding the, the steel track. Um, the British only ever had rub, uh, steel track on the chaffee. They never put the, the, the rubber on it. That was more of a, an American sort of later addition. And I'm gonna to have to ask, because obviously it's, it's very obvious, this red box here, um, clear, clearly not sort of there with the vehicle, what's all that about? So actually the, there's the, the cast housing there, the bright red cast housing over the top, that is actually part of the vehicle. That's the fire extinguisher pull cord. So it's got a more modern looking tin cover on the bottom, as you can see, bolted on the side. That's actually to stop um, so somebody children it. or you know anyone wants to go, oh, what happens when I pull this? Because it will deploy a CO2 extinguisher uh, into the engine bay. And obviously we, we don't want that while it's sat here on display. Okay, so uh, this is the, the, wor the worst part of the vehicle when we received it. Everything in here was completely corroded. So both the Cadillac V8s were sea solid, full of water. Uh, these side panels, these white side panels, um, they'd completely corroded away uh, and they'd flaked into the bottom. So you can imagine the pile of rust that would have been in there. Um, if you look just down the bottom in there, there's the, the support brackets for the radiators, the fan cowlings, all of those were, were perished beyond repair. Everything had to be uh, remanufactured so we had to fabricate all new side panels source a new fuel tank and obviously we had to fully rebuild the engines it looks quite easy to work on i mean just the sheer position in there is it is it or yeah so actually this is this is the, you can tell they've learned from the from the other tanks so from like from the stewart for instance um onto this being late the later model of the light tank um, they've used existing technology so cadillac engines were built for for the cars for the staff cars in america um, so you can get the parts easily. Uh, you're very, they're a bit smaller, so they're easier to manage. Um, you can change the spark plugs in this without taking the engines out. 
and to actually get the engines in and out. If one engine failed, I mean, you could probably have one out in an hour. Wow. Two of you, eat, no problem. You remove the rear decks, undo some engine mounts and a few brackets and out it comes. It's all designed to be quick release. And from, I mean, from a crew point of view, again, first parade, general maintenance, as a restore, I mean, obviously for us in, in the Armoured Corps, it was like every day you do a first parade or something, but what do you suggest as a, you know, a vehicle that's in a, a fleet like this, a museum fleet? So how often do they check it? Every time before they drive it or? Yeah, so it's, uh, for every vehicle we restore, we actually make a complete user manual. Oh, so you, wow. get, you get the handbooks that you, you had in World War II. We would read those yeah. and then get a better, more of a modern understanding of how, how the vehicle works and then create our own manual. So in there would be a first and a last parade sheet uh, for the, 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 doing it the military way, the correct way. Um, and you, you, you do a certain amount of checks in the engine bay anyway. Uh, so part of that process would be pop the engine hatch open and check the oil levels, make sure there's nothing damaged, nothing loose, um, and you'd work around the vehicle in that manner. And all the lettering on there, I mean, is that, is that what they had or is that something you've added onto it? Yeah, they, they would have had that. We found new old stock parts that had the correct labelling on and we've seen photographs of original, you know, original photos um, with the correct labelling on. But we've painted those red and, and put the label on just so they're really obvious and actually it looks quite cool because they stand out. <laughs> and I think while we're up here, Gav, we have to mention, I mean, talk, I mean, we always talk about attention to detail, but you can see, you know, the tools everywhere, the ammunition boxes, I think I'm on, is this a corned beef box or something I'm on at the moment? You're actually uh, on World War II ammunition boxes. Um, yeah, I found those at, um, at a fair. Uh, they, uh, to make you feel better, they're probably about 250 quid each. Yeah, so I feel like I shouldn't really be standing <laughs> on them at the moment there. But I mean, it is incredible. And what it does is it really like... Uh, you know, it adds to the feel of the tank, you know what I mean? It makes it feel like it's about to go on, you know, to war or yeah, operations so or something. In, within our company, uh, we, we like to refer to these additional items as salad dressing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you get just a plain salad, it's a bit boring, but if you put a bit of dressing on it, it cheers it up a bit. And that's that's exactly where we're going with it. Absolutely. And again, I mean, we have to mention the 50 cows up there um, on, its, on its bracket at the moment. Um, and you told me that's a replica of 50 cow. It is, yeah. So believe it or not, that is a complete replica. There's not an original part on it. I mean, it looks incredible from a distance. I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody would be able to tell the difference between that and the real thing. Yeah, that, that's exactly why we've done it. Yeah, it's a replica. You don't have to worry about legal problems. It's, you know, it's not a live firearm or anything. So it's, yeah, it's perfect for what you're trying to do with it. So here we are now in the turret. And I have to say, I mean, again, I don't want to really want to go on about attention to detail, but this is unbelievable. It almost blows me away, really. Gav. There is so much going on in here. Yeah, so it, it is a busy place now. It's got everything in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's taken us pretty much the duration of the restoration to find all the bits. So when, when we received it, there was nothing in here at all. All the boxes were perished, brackets missing, uh, the vision blocks above your head, they were smashed. The remit when it first came in was, if we're going to do it, let's do it properly. So I had to start finding every single part and that involved getting the parts book out and going through the CES list, the, the, the complete equipment schedule to yeah. figure out what parts were supposed to go where and what the sticker label should be. Yeah, I was just had to start trawling military shows and you know events, eBay, you know, just browsing the internet to try and find each and every component. It's incredible. I mean, if you look at some of the stuff, I mean, we've got canteens um, up there, we've got ammunition boxes, everything's labelled, of course. We've got small arms there. Um, underneath the floor there, I know you've got a couple of dummy rounds, main armoured rounds as well. Um, so it is incredible. And I have to say, I opened the grenade box, and there we go, we've even we've got a dummy grenade yeah, don't, in there. Yeah, don't so. pull the pin on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but surely this, this level of detail is taking it to another extreme. I mean, most people, of course, you know, look at the outside of a vehicle. But I mean, the owner must have been absolutely, I mean, he obviously is very proud to bring people inside the vehicle and say, look, this is exactly what it would look like. Yeah, it's, it's all, for him, I think it's all about the uh, preserving of history, telling the story. Um, and most importantly, it's the, the British story. And obviously, as we've mentioned already, the, the chaffee was used by the British and that hence why we've got the 19 set fixed in the back. Was there anything in here particularly that was A, hard to find or something, or again, like we mentioned before, was difficult to work on? Uh, difficult to find. Um, there was lots of little things that are difficult, lots. Um, I couldn't sit here and list them all off. And it's the silliest of things. I mean, one for instance is the, the spotlight handle just above your left shoulder there. Um, they're very difficult to find, especially complete and, and functional. So optics, Gav, I mean, I can understand perhaps periscope's the source, but looking down here, I mean, just to my left at the moment, I've got where, you know, the gunner's position. Everything appears to work. Um, everything appears to operate. We've got, you know, Travis Hamwheel, elevation Hamwheel, 
firing pistol grip and all that. But what about the actual sights? Yeah, so the, the sight you just pointed out there, that's that's just like a, an evolution of periscope um, and has a, like a sighting system built into it. And I, I was lucky to be to just stumble across that. Um, so I bought it up quick, I knew what it was. Um, but the actual main gunner's telescope there, um, we had that as one of the first items that we purchased when we, res we was restoring the vehicle, it came up for sale, but it needed overhauling. Um, and I accidentally stumbled across a guy. Um, I've got a nice story about it. I went to buy a micrometer, an imperial micrometer for a fiver that I saw for sale. Um, and the guy gave me his address. It was my grandparents' old house. So I go around and collect this micrometer and say to the guy, um, you know, my grandparents used to live here. So I, I had the guided tour of the house to see how it was. And in, in conversation, it, it came up that he does gun sights. So he's actually overhauled that telescope in my grandparents' garage. Incredible, absolutely amazing. I mean, the, the, the whole vehicle is, as I said, you just, it's very hard, I mean, even on camera, to just sort of comprehend, you know, it is the first vehicle, and any shadow of that, I've sat inside and thought, I could just see this, you know, it looks like it's in operational service at the moment. It is that level of detail. You must feel extremely proud when you, know, yourselves and the team have, have completed something like this. Yeah, yeah, every, every single vehicle that we do, it, it's, you know, it's, it feels like a lifetime's work, you know, it's like a real life achievement, yeah, I'm very proud of it. Um, uh, and it, it's that end result. You put in, you put in all those years of effort just just for the the accreditation at the end that you've done a nice job. And is it nice when you hand it over to the customer and say, "There you go, you know, we've now finished it." Yeah, th this one in particular, um, it was a long slog to get it to this standard. Um, and when he came to do his final inspection, um, he came away and didn't pick anything up. I mean, he was so pleased with it. So we're now down here. I'm, I'm actually in the co-driver's position, also the bow gunner as well. So quite unusual, Gav, I'm the co-driver. Yeah, so normally you just have a bow gunner that side who would operate the machine gun in front of you. But in the chaffee, it's actually got dual controls. So you've got a set of tillers either side of your legs um, and there's a throttle pedal on the floor as well. Um, you just connect an inner pin and then you've got, you've got control of the engines as well as me, uh, which would be really good if you're trying to teach someone to drive. Absolutely, I never thought of it, to be honest, as well. Um, I mean, the controls over there on your side, um, it, it looks quite straightforward. Is it a good vehicle to drive? This is an absolute pleasure to drive, yeah. This, it's, it's, it's lightweight, it's got plenty of power, it's fast. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it's fully automatic, so you just put it in drive and, and hit the loud pedal. And, I mean, quite nippy, from what, certainly what I've seen of it driving around. Yeah, yeah, it goes like a whip here. Yeah, it's very quick. <laughs> you did mention earlier, Gav, about some of the, I mean, again, attention to detail, um, some of the identification plates um, on the left there. And I believe they were made, you, you made them yourselves, you got somebody to make them. Yeah, yeah, we found a guy, I, I think he was in Poland. Um, he, he made uh, all the, the data plates using the, the original acid etch method, um, and he's copied them from photographs and, and manuals, um, and they're, they're identical, absolutely identical. So are we okay to start this vehicle up? Uh, yeah, I can't see why not. I'll, I'll do uh, a quick first parade for you, and, and we'll be able to weld it up, yeah. The M24 Chaffee was an American light tank used during the latter part of World War II. It also saw service in the Korean War and by the French in the war in Algeria and the First Indochina War. In British service, it was given the name Chaffee after the United States Army General Adna R. Chaffee. Reports received prior to the end of hostilities were generally positive. Crews likely improved cross-terrain performance and reliability, but were most appreciative of the 75mm gun which was a vast improvement over the 37mm used in the M3 and M5 light tanks. The bigger gun gave its crews a much better chance to fight back. The first M24s reached Europe in November 1944. Their contribution to winning the war in Europe was minor. Too few arrived too late to replace the worn out M5s of the armoured divisions. And that's it from us today. Thank you so much for watching. Join us next time when we take a closer look at the restoration and maintenance of a Sherman. And once again, we're joined by Gavin and the crew from Armoured Engineering Limited. Mm -hmm.